Um, and if it comes in the middle of the night, I won't be able to sleep. I have to go in and do this, you know, or do it at a few hours. We sometimes do things at five in the morning before the regular schedule starts. So pucker sign is a sign of extra trauma and there's more likely other things are going wrong. And what about pulseless fractures? About two to 3% of the time, the supracondylar fracture comes to the emergency room without a pulse. So in the United States, the, uh, the ambulance drivers will frequently splint an arm totally straight. And when the arm is totally straight, the artery could be tethered over that bone. So we teach the residents, the first thing you do is just gently flex the elbow, maybe to 30 or 40 degrees and pull on it. Oftentimes just doing that, the pulse comes right back. It's kind of fun. You have this white hand, flex the elbow, pulse comes back, you feel like you're a hero. So Dr. Uh, Chuck Melman is gonna do a great job of talking more than I do about pulses and vascular status, but I wanna go over it just a little bit because it's so important. I think it's not bad to hear this twice. So what do we look at? Is it a warm and well-perfused hand or is it a white and cool hand? And the topic here is all of these are pulseless supracondylar fractures, but some of them have good perfusion. And if it is warm and well perfused, it's urgent, you wanna do it that night, but most of the time the pulse comes back and almost never is there a compartment syndrome or other vascular problems. You generally don't need a vascular surgeon to come in. Now, if the hand is white and cool and has no pulse, that's an absolute emergency. Cancel other cases, get it to the operating room immediately. And we found that this has a high rate of compartment syndrome and a high rate of needing vascular repair. So if the hand is really cool and white, I might even tell my vascular surgeons ahead of time, hey, we may need you later. And you don't need to get an arteriogram because we know where the pulse is lost. All that does is waste time. This is a frequent test question. Okay, nerve injuries. The number one nerve injury in an extension type supracondylar fracture is the median nerve. If the median nerve is injured, there won't be flexion of the thumb. You want to do the OK sign. And this is because the proximal fragment goes forward and hits the median nerve. Now, in a flexion type fracture, the number one nerve problem is an ulnar nerve palsy. Because again, the proximal fragment goes posterior, hits the nerve. And it's very, very important that we establish this pre-op. Because one of the worst things that could happen is we have a normal exam ahead of time and postoperatively the nerve is out because then you know that whatever you did hurt the nerve and you probably have to undo it. And the nightmare scenario is if nobody checked the nerves ahead of time and you discover that you have a nerve injury post-op, what do you do? Um, because you don't know if you caused it or if it was caused by the injury. So any sensory nerve injury has to be treated urgently. That shouldn't wait 24 hours. It should go either in the middle of the night or first thing in the morning. In particular, a median nerve injury could mask the symptoms of a compartment syndrome. This is a frequent lawsuit. If somebody doesn't recognize this and treat it soon and it goes to a compartment syndrome, uh, that could be a catastrophic result. Oh, I'm sorry, going in the wrong direction there. Okay, so a little a pearl for ulnar nerve function is ask, sometimes the kids can't cross their fingers when they're really young, but they somehow will always pinch you. And if you can feel the first dorsal interosseous muscle set as the patient pinches you, you know that the ulnar motor nerve is intact. Okay, so do we need to treat supracondylar fractures with nerve injuries urgent? Well, we do if it's any sensory nerve injury, but the one exception is an isolated anterior interosseous nerve. There's no sensation to that. And we've shown in a multi-center uh, multi study that that is not a reason for urgency by itself. You can do that the next day. We don't worry about that. The anterior interosseous nerve seems to be injured early, uh, easily, even without too much trauma. So here's a pearl. As long as a patient can absolutely totally straighten the arm, probably the elbow is okay. In other pearls, it's pretty similar for the finger and the knee. If you're not sure what's going on, ask them to fully straighten the joint. If they can, there's a good chance that there's not a major fracture. Okay, so in summary, emergency cases, 
pulseless, poorly perfused compartment syndrome, absolute emergency, get it in. And urgent, things you want to do in the middle of the night, puckering, ecchymosis, excessive swelling, high energy, sensory nerve injury. And we used to say forearm fractures, but now there's a few papers out showing just because you have a forearm fracture and a supracondylar fracture doesn't necessarily mean that you have an increased risk of compartment syndrome, but I'd still be a little extra worried. Okay, now treatment. So in the United States, more and more of these cases are treated with closed reduction as opposed to open reduction. So over 90% of supracondylar fractures in the United States are treated closed. And you see this is happening more and more and more over time. So what are the indications for closed treatment? Almost everything. Almost every one of the supracondylar fractures we see, we want to try to treat closed. If it's an open fracture, you know, it's already open, stick your finger in there, maybe it could help you. If you're reducing it and you feel this rubbery feeling, you don't feel good bone on bone, the median nerve could be in there, so you might want to open it. Or if you do a closed reduction percutaneous pinning and post-op there's a nerve or vascular injury, you may want to open and see what's going on and fix it. Okay, so let's go type by type. So a type one fracture is minimally displaced. You may see a fracture, you may see a posterior elevated fat pad, but Bauman's angle is good, anterior humeral line is good, so the overall alignment is good, and this will heal all by itself. We put them in a long arm cast for three weeks, they all heal, they all do well. Um, but beware of medial comminution. This is a frequent test question. If there is medial comminution, um, then we measure Bauman's angle, it's probably less than 10 degrees, this needs surgery. And if this doesn't get surgery, then what we have is cubitus varus. So a type two fracture is a, type, is a case in which the anterior humeral line does not touch the capitellum. We cannot accept this position. Remodeling is not reliable. Now, maybe it is in really little kids, but I think to stay out of trouble, we should assume that remodeling is not reliable all the time. So in the old days, even textbooks said that you had to flex the elbow greater than 90 degrees for a type two supracondylar fracture. But if you do flex the elbow greater than 90 degrees, what happens well, is your, you could lose the pulse and compartment pressure increases. So we never, ever, ever want to flex the elbow more than 90 degrees in a supracondylar fracture because you're putting the elbow and the arm at risk for compartment syndrome. So type two fractures generally are treated with closed reduction and pinning. Now there's a number of papers out there. One of them is from Chuck's Institution. There's a few newer papers showing most of the time you can treat a type two supracondylar fracture just in a cast without surgery. However, somewhere around 20, 25% of the time, it doesn't work. It doesn't end up in a good position and you have to go to the operating room. Um, so if it doesn't reduce 25% of the time and you have to do something and the kid doesn't get back to see you in time and it heals in a bad position, that's a bad result that could have been prevented with closed reduction percutaneous pinning. So I'd say nowadays, if it's a test question, you reduce and pin a type two. And in real life, in my institution, we reduce in all type two fractures and we've done studies showing they have wonderful results with a very, very small rate of infection or other complications. Okay, so a type three fracture, this is easy. You just fix it. We know we need to fix a type three fracture. And how do you do your operating room setup? I personally like having a C arm uh, within a position where it can go both to the lateral and to the AP. Now you usually don't need to move the C arm around, but why not set up your room so you can do everything and you won't have to set that up later. And then anytime you're doing any surgery in my mind, the surgeon's eyes should be looking directly at the TV. Um, so you could look at the elbow, you could look at the TV, for the residents especially, take your time to set up the room. If you find that you have to turn your head around to see the screen, it's a lot harder to put the pins in the right place. And that's a- I think that's an excellent point, Dr. Skaggs. I call that operating room choreography and the surgeon should not get torticollis. 
Yeah, thank you, Dr. Melman. So head positioning. Um, we find that when the kids have really short arms, you have to keep pulling the arm to get a good image. So why not put those kids' arms right on the arm board or the kids' heads right on the arm board to begin with? So then you can get a good image of the head without pulling or of the elbow without pulling the head off the table. And the tube should go opposite where the fracture is because we know as we flex up the arm, it can go almost right to the mouth. Marty Herman says it's a good idea preoperatively to make a diagram and show the residents exactly where we want the pins to go. So we know what we want to end up with. Okay, so how do we reduce a supracondylar fracture? Step one, apply traction. Now notice traction is being applied with the elbow bent. Why are we doing that? Because we don't want the artery and nerve to be tethering over that sharp bone. So we'll apply traction in this position, maybe for a minute or two. And sometimes you can almost hear a pop as the supracondylar fracture reduces and pulls through the brachialis muscle. So here's a point where we may wanna have a little bit of patience, just apply traction. And Dr. Melman, please interrupt at any point if you have a pearl. We've uh, done this together before and it makes it more interesting rather than me just talking. Okay, so step two is with the image above you, we wanna reduce the AP uh, portion of the fracture. It could be with translation, it could be pushing, it could be a little bit of varus valgus. Once we have it reduced in the AP plane, then we have the challenge of reducing these thin knife edges. It's a very thin piece of bone. So how do we get that to reduce? The secret is periosteum. There should be big, thick periosteum intact posteriorly. So periosteum is our friend. Once we reduce, we fix on the AP plane, then we flex the elbow up and push up. We're pushing up here on the distal fragment and that's gonna crunch the bone together and place the periosteum on tension. Okay, so here's one of the most subtle points in supracondylar fracture reduction. Most textbooks say you wanna pronate. Now, why do you wanna pronate? Okay, here's the answer. So most supracondylar fractures reduce posterior medial. So if the fracture is a posterior medial fracture, that means the proximal piece went lateral and the lateral periosteum is torn. The medial periosteum is intact. And if you do it with your own arm, as you pronate, what happens is you are applying compression laterally. So pronation compresses laterally and it, there's tension medially. So that intact hinge helps close it down. Now here's a video I'm gonna show you. This is something I made, uh, let's see if I could get to the video. So this will take just a second here. Now what the video shows is, oh, come on, video play. So imagine that this is a posterior medial displacement and as a posterior medially displaces, the medial periosteum remains intact which is represented by that string. And then you can imagine as you pronate, it closes the lateral portion and it puts tension across the medial tension where there is good uh, periosteum intact. So now here's what you really have to remember when you're doing surgery. If you pronate and it doesn't work, think about supinating because sometimes it's posterior laterally displaced and in that case, the lateral periosteum is intact and you have to supinate. So the bottom line is try pronating. If pronating doesn't work, try supinating. Okay, then we flex all the way up. And if the fingers are touching the shoulder, there's a good chance, show you that again. If the fingers are touching the shoulder, there's a good chance that the fracture is fully reduced. So the fingers should touch the shoulder. Next is the milking technique. So the distal humerus is kind of wide and sometimes pops through the brachialis. And then we should have a lot of patience here as we use our thumbs to push and push and push in the brachialis. And sometimes you hear, you almost feel a pop as the bone pops through. It's a very satisfying feeling. 
Now beware that when you do this flexion move, if the artery and nerve are in there, that can have this rubbery reduction. It doesn't feel like bone and bone. You wanna stop right there and consider opening the fracture. So how do we know if it's reduced? Let's keep this simple, just two things. Anterior humeral line crosses the capitellum. Bauman's angle is greater than 10 degrees. You don't need to worry about a lot more than that. Now, how do we get the lateral X-ray? In general, we want to rotate the arm because it's just easier. But sometimes if it's a very unstable fracture, you try to rotate the arm and the fracture falls apart. So what we do in that case is we rotate the machine instead of the arm. Now, a little bit of translation is okay. Translation remodels. All we really care about is anterior humeral line, Bauman's angle, little translation, eh, who cares, not a big deal. Now, sometimes it's reasonable to get an oblique image to view the medial and lateral column. And oftentimes these don't line up perfectly. So I encourage you, save the worst image you have, you know, either translation or not quite lining up intraoperatively. So when you see the patient postoperatively, you can compare your worst operative image to the image you have post-op, and then you can know, oh, it didn't fall apart. It was never quite perfect. So I'm a little bit lazy. And once we get the reduction, we use tape to tape the arm in a hyperflexed position. And then we can relax knowing that the fracture is reduced and put the pins in the perfect place without rushing. So the way that God made an elbow is that he or she put a lot of cartilage right there. And what's wonderful is you can take the pin just in your hand, not with the drill on it, just with your hand. So you have lots of precision and you stick the pin exactly where you want it in the cartilage. You can then rotate the elbow back and forth, make sure the pin is in a good position. And then even a trained monkey could just drive it across the fracture site. And the general rule is you want two pins for a type two, three pins for a type three. If there's any question, put in an extra pin. It's not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of good judgment. So what about injuring the ulnar nerve with a medial pin? This used to be controversial. I don't think it's controversial anymore. Lateral pins do not injure nerves. Medial pins do injure nerves sometimes, even in the best of hands. So I would say at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, we probably use lateral pins only in one out of a, I'm sorry, in 99% or more of the fractures. We will only use a medial pin maybe in one in 100 or one in 200 fractures. Okay, so what are the rules of pinning? This is the most important. You want to separate the pins at the fracture site as far as you can. There's a great study out of San Diego saying at least 13 millimeters or even easier to remember is at least one third the distance of the fracture. Number two is make sure that the pins go through the cortex. You may need to rotate the arm a bit, get oblique views, but save those views with the pins through the cortex. Um, so you rotate the arm, make sure you get a perfect lateral view and save it. So what happens if you rotate the arm and it falls apart? Then you rotate the C arm. Sometimes you can't rotate the arm, you rotate the C arm. So the AP x-ray is kind of difficult to interpret when the elbow is flexed, you know, the other bones are in the way. So after the pins are in, extend the elbow a little bit, get a really good image of the elbow. You wanna save that. And then this is important, stress the elbow to varus and valgus intraoperatively live with the image going and make sure it doesn't fall apart because you want it to fall apart in front of you so you can fix it right then. You don't want it to fall apart tomorrow. That's not a good idea. And oh, and if there's any question ever, put in a third pin or even a fourth pin. Um, there really is not that much downside to putting in extra pins. I'm not sure I've ever seen a growth arrest in this area you know, due to pins in a supracondylar fracture. So let's talk about some bad examples. So this is bad. The Things are too close together. Biomechanically, of course, this is gonna separate. Here's another one. This is crossing right at the fracture site. You know, that's bad technique. We wanna separate it as much as possible. And then we bend the pins. I personally like to use thick felt because it's really cheap because sometimes those pins can go into the skin if we don't protect the skin. 
Um, this is uh, something that we developed about 20 years ago. We stole it from DuPont. DuPont Institute used to put foam on club foot casts. We put foam directly on the skin. Don't wrap anything around it. And once we started doing this, then there's not much swelling and the residents very rarely have to split the cast in the middle of the night. Now one could put on plaster slabs, but plaster is a lot weaker and a lot heavier. And note that the arm is never really flexed more than 45 or 60 degrees. And we should always make sure that we feel the pulse in the position of casting. If there's any question, straighten it and straighten it and straighten it. It's okay. You don't need the cast flex to hold the fracture because the metal pins are holding the fracture. And this is a paper that is haunting and we should all have this in our head and it's tested a lot. So if the patient after pinning a supracondylar fracture has more pain and needs narcotics, something's wrong. So the test question will say, the patient had a supracondylar fracture and he's requiring more, more medicine. The answer is there's a compartment syndrome going on. We have to be very cognizant of this. So in summary, to fix a supracondylar fracture, traction, then varus valgus, fix it, flex it all the way up, try pronating first. If pronating doesn't work, try supinating, put in the pins. Don't hesitate to put in another pin. Testability, so it falls apart in front of you, write that and you fix it. Cast to allow for swelling and remove the pins in three weeks. As was brought up earlier in this course, if you leave the pins in a elbow for more than three weeks, or even a knee or any joint, you put that joint at risk for infection in a septic joint. For some reason that I don't understand, all supracondylar fractures seem to heal within three weeks. This is very different from lateral condyle fractures. Sometimes lateral condyle fractures could take six weeks or even eight or 12 weeks sometimes. Okay, special situations here. Let's make sure, and we're plenty on time here. We're gonna end within 10 minutes. Special situations are a type four fracture. So type four fractures, you sometimes don't know they're type four until you're in the operating room. They can fall into extension and they can fall into flexion. So in these cases, a lot of periosteum is torn, very unstable fracture. And what about a flexion type fracture? So this is a normal elbow, anterior humeral line crosses the capitellum. In a flexion type fracture, the capitellum is anterior to the anterior humeral line. Now what's kind of interesting, in a flexion type fracture, the AP X-ray often looks very normal. And the reason why is the X-ray beam kind of comes from this angle and it really is doing an AP of the distal humerus. So if we were smart enough, hey, stop that. If we were smart enough to set up the C-arm in a way that you can get an AP and a lateral, when you're doing a type four supracondylar fracture, which you sometimes discover interoperatively, you can then get the AP in this position, get the lateral in this position. And the trick is you wanna put the pins into the distal fragment first, reduce it in the AP, then switch the C-arm around, reduce it in the lateral plane, then even a trained monkey could drive the pins across and you've done it. I would say 90% of the time with a type four fracture, you should be able to treat this closed. Like, of course you could do it open, but why open if you don't need to? Okay, residents, let's think about this. I wish we could take a poll. What is going on here? Is that an elbow dislocation? No, in a 17 year old, I'm sorry, 17 month old, the physis is weaker. That is a sign of a physial fracture, which is treated like a supracondylar fracture. So the same type of reduction is done, except you really want to pull traction and you don't want to bend it up and down a lot. And sometimes in a little kid shooting in a little bit of dye shows you the joint and shows you the capitellum and helps you know if you reduce it. Okay, I'm gonna leave this to Chuck to talk about pulses, but if you have a situation in which you need to open, I would encourage you to consider doing a transverse incision here because it heals so well. Now it's scary to do this at first because there's scary things underneath it. 
Now I'd like everybody to do is flex your elbow up to 90 degrees and you should be able to feel where the Lacertus fibrosis is. So feel your bicep tendon and just medial to it, you feel this sharp Lacertus fibrosis. That is the key to opening a supracondylar fracture. You go through the skin, you go through the Lacertus fibrosis and right there is the artery and nerve medial to the biceps tendon. This is not that hard of a dissection. You know, once you do it once, you say, hey, I could do this. This was a case when I was a fellow 25 years ago, we opened it up and here's one end of an artery and here's the other end of the artery. And if you open it up, sometimes it's hard to find the nerve in the artery. It could be anterior to the fracture, it could be posterior, it could be in between. And the secret is if you open it up and you can't find the artery and nerve, go medial and go proximal. So go to normal tissue and you should eventually be able to find the artery and nerve. And then you start to go distal to the fracture site and you find both ends. Okay, so here's a bad situation. This child pre-op neurologically intact, post-op median nerve was out and the kid was in lots and lots of pain. So we must assume that we did this to the patient. We need to undo this fracture. We need to, I should say the first step is to look for the nerve surgically or look for the artery surgically because sometimes the nerve or artery is not in the fracture site, but there's tissue near the artery or nerve pulling it into the fracture site. And just that little bit of traction is what's causing the problem. And here's about the last thing we're looking at, medial pins. There used to be lots of controversy if you use a medial pin or not. We just have to accept the fact that if you use medial pins, sometimes the ulnar nerve will be injured. This was done in the United States. This pin is going right through the nerve. Now, most of the time the pin doesn't go through the nerve, it goes near the nerve and it just kind of crunches it down a little bit. So most of the good studies show somewhere around one in 22 medial pins will injure an ulnar nerve. So if we could avoid it, which we usually can, we should. And this was brought up earlier in the question and answer session. Um, the blood supply to the trochlear and capitellum is only from one artery posterior. So I would say if we're going in to reduce a supracondylar fracture or do bigger surgeries like doing an osteotomy, which we'll talk about next, we never, ever, ever want to dissect posteriorly. And I would go so far as to say this probably no reason in a young kid to do a posterior approach to a supracondylar fracture. Like, yeah, you could do it. Yeah, it's easy, but you're risking a catastrophic injury, which is the fishtail avascular necrosis. Okay, last topic here is cubitus ferus. So what do you do when you have a kid with cubitus ferus? And most of the time you also have an extension injury. So this is a fracture which is not reduced and the child could hyperextend the elbow. So there's a deformity in two planes. So what used to be taught is to do just a simple closing wedge. If you do a simple closing wedge, then you end up having a big prominence there. And the family doesn't like that big bump in the elbow. You find it not cosmetically approaching or, or wonderful. So what we could do is something like a Wiltsy type technique, originally described for the ankle. If we cut out a triangle here, cut out a triangle there, then this distal piece will spin and it won't pop out laterally. And the secret to making these cuts is first, you just cut parallel to the joint. Then you could deliver the proximal humerus through literally a four centimeter incision out. Then you can complete the more intricate cuts. And the key here is that you wanna leave a little bit of bone on the side there. And then after you make these wonderful cuts, then the distal bone fits in like a lock and key here. And that creates a fair amount of stability. And this can fix the, uh, the frontal plane deformity. It could also fix the lateral plane deformity. So I used to be a carpenter. That's how I paid for a lot of my education. And the carpenters say measure twice, cut once. This is really important to get it right. You can't go to the lumbar store and buy more bone. So do your pre-op planning, measure the arms, measure the x-rays. I even make an interoperative template. What size, you know, the big thing is what size triangle of bone do we want to cut out there? And here's just one example. We have a biplane deformity. 
This is what the child looks like. And this is what it looked like intraoperatively. So you could see that Bauman's angle is now much better than it was before. And we could see that the anterior humeral line goes through the capitellum. So now we have a good anatomic position after making those cuts. And that is the end of my talk. I am very grateful to your society and for Sandeep for taking all the work and energy uh, to help teach us all and to help us deliver better care to kids. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Skax. That was really masterful. Uh, we'll take the questions after Dr. Melman's talk, but I just have one, one question for you. Where do I get a trained monkey? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, but that okay. is a really important so, point. You know, anytime you can get the pins into the distal <laughs> fracture first, it just makes it so easy to then run it across after your reduction. Yeah, it's a lovely. That was superb. So over to you, Dr. Melman, and then I think Taral will ask questions uh, for both the talks. Very good. Have we uh, got the slides? Dr. Yeah, Melman, we just say that. that we love your cowboy appearance, sir. Well, it's... Uh, it's good to entertain the audience. The slides are up. Are they good, please? No, we can't see them. You need to share the screen. Very good. And now? Yeah, they're coming up. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Perfect. So yeah. um, Dr. Skaggs has had done a uh, tremendous uh, presentation instead of Instead of following a monkey act, I'm following a dog act, a wonderful dog act. And so the scientific program is uh, really impressive. We're proud to be part of it. And we will do our best to uh, do this in the next 20 minutes. Um, these were, these, this was the bio slide that we showed earlier. Um, and my disclosures are that I am involved with a board review course. Uh, which I do get paid some money for, which is shocking. But all the other work I do, I work for free. So apparently I'm very cheap labor, all the other work. Uh, some of the concepts we'll touch on were highlighted in a article that I published with my good friend, uh, Dr. Frick, a couple of years as a supplement in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma. But our topic is the pink pulseless hand. And uh, I want to start by saying that Gartland uh, classification was the classic one, twos, and threes. And thank you to Dr. Skaggs. We now have a type four. And one proposal that I would make today is, is maybe we should just think about adding a five. Maybe there should be a Gartland five, like a five alarm fire. And a Gartland five would be any supercondylar who is deemed to be pulseless uh, by your definition of pulseless. And so this is to say that they deserve more attention. They deserve more of a reaction. Uh, and to call them a Gartland 5 is a one possibility. The problem is, is real. Based on large administrative database information in the States, there are still about 40 Volkman ischemic contractures that occur every year in our country after supracondylar fractures. So for our country, that's a, a little bit, that's a bit less than one per state. And so each individual surgeon's experience is remarkably limited regarding this horrible outcome. And almost every surgeon has multiple examples of where they did see a, a, a pulseless patient and things turned out okay. And as surgeons, that's always our bias. We want good things to happen for our patients. We don't want bad things to happen. And we tend to remember those cases and it reinforces our, our level of understanding. Now there is uh, a, a lack of complete agreement on multiple points. This is a paper which is in the Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics, which has been published ahead of print. It's my colleague, uh, Dr. Brighton uh, and, and the others from North Carolina. And they looked at the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons appropriate use criteria. And they looked back at their own uh, pulseless cases. They found 52 pulseless cases out of over 600 supracondylars. And they found that when they applied these so-called appropriate use criteria, only 20% of the time were they doing things appropriately. Another half the time they were doing things maybe appropriate. And then they got into some scary 23% rarely and 5% of what the heck were you doing? And so even the experts are not in total agreement. Although 
we do agree that the disvascular and the postal superconduit deserves more attention. The other point that I would make in almost every single case, when you see a postal supercondylar, you will see an extension type supercondylar that has displaced posterior laterally. These are my colleagues from Colorado, uh, Nancy Hadley Miller and Gaia Georgopoulos, which have published this wonderful little study tucked away in the Blue Journal Orthopedics that shows a higher rate of complications. Name a complication, it's higher in posterior laterals. This is Dr. Skaggs' figure from one of his publications. And some of this posterior lateral displacement may put this so-called supratrochlear artery on greater uh, traction. And, th and this may be responsible for tethering or kinking the vessels. So my assertion here is that many of our core methods of assessing vascularity are flawed. The peripheral pulses, we can feel pulses, right? Well, a 50 observer study looking at peripheral pulses found there's only a 33 to 60% sensitivity and maybe a 20% rate of false positives. Again, our strong bias is, oh, I think I feel something. We want good things to happen to our patients. We care about our patients. And so this rate of false positivity is rather intuitive in my opinion. Well, maybe capillary refill would be better. Uh, well, our colleague Norm Otsuka, now based out of uh, New York State, used a blood pressure cuff to, to knowingly alter the arterial flow to the limbs of children. And they found no correlation between arterial blood flow and capillary re refill time, even when the blood pressure cuff was completely inflated and there was thus no arterial flow. And capillary refill is an inexact science to say the very least. Is this good capillary refill? Is this bad capillary? Maybe the surgeon's finger looks rather pink. Here's another version. And so one 1,000, two 1,000. And if there's a criteria that I think we should teach our trainees in these areas, it is if there is any question, unless it is the briskest of the brisk, the most normal looking rapid return, then we should be very, uh, 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 we should be very one way or the other. It's either normal or there's everything else. And as soon as you're on the other side of everything else, you worry. Now, all of us have held this so-called handheld Doppler. It's one of the most ubiquitous instruments in trauma ORs, uh, et cetera. Uh, it's amazing when you look at the literature on this device, we may question the value of this. These, were, uh, these are vascular surgeons showing a 43% sensitivity. Now this was lower extremities in adults with suspected vascular trauma. And so perhaps we need more studies in our children utilizing these same devices. This is another vascular hey Chuck, can surgeon. can I ask you a question here? Yes, sir. Chuck, are you suggesting that when you use that handheld Doppler about half the time it's missing a problem? I'm telling you that it is much, the data when you dig into this is shocking. These are vascular surgeons saying the handheld, the handheld Doppler, what you hear is not always what you get. Now, if I was going to make a case uh, for using it, I like to compare, like, uh, like David alluded to earlier, I think God was good to the orthopedic surgeon because she gave us a normal side to compare to. And I think you are in a much more defensible position if you, if you check the trauma side and listen to it carefully, and then you check the well side, and you account for the patient's uh, blood pressure, and you tell, and you document, and you say that that sounds the same. You know, many, many people, you know, what's normal on the handheld Doppler? It's actually this thing called a triphasic signal as opposed to a biphasic signal. And so I don't know how many people have perfect pitch. I'm not one of them. Uh, and so comparing one side to the other makes a lot of sense. My colleague Ruben So from the KK Children's there in Singapore has a nice study looking at a, the uh, pulse oximeter and just not the presence of a beep, but the presence of a wave form. On, so a more sophisticated pulse oximeter is what uh, Dr. So wrote about uh, in the clinics in orthopedic surgery. So that's another device that may help increase our, our or decrease our comfort with the pulseless supercondyle that we're looking at. My colleague from Australia, Dr. David Little, has pointed out that this thing called near infrared spectroscopy, which measures tissue level oxygenation, may be of value. It needs to be studied more. We need more studies. And this is myself with Dr. Little, uh, Mr. Little, I should say, since he is from the, uh, Australia, and then the one, the only, Manaj Ramachandran there as we were together in London. So thank you, Dr. Little, for stirring the pot and making us think about NEARS. Our adult colleagues, 
we're much less uh, impressed with NIRS, at least the current status of NIRS for adult lower extremity trauma. And so this is a paper published in the 2018 American JBJS that raises questions about the current uh, utility of NIRS in that setting. So clearly this deserves more study. Well, what about a fancier Doppler? What about a color flow Doppler or the so-called Doppler duplex? This is another step short of surgical exploration. So if, and I understand that there are resource heavy and resource light practice settings for our orthopedic brothers and sisters, and not everyone may have this, but if you have this, this is a powerful tool. A series of papers in the early 90s really established what a strong tool this is. Uh, amazing, this is a study out of the uh, Department of Surgery, University of California, 100% sensitivity, 100% specificity. I could list like five other papers that all list incredible utility of this device. Our colleagues in Rome, led by Ernesto Epolito, uh, looked at this in children and published it in the Journal of Bone and Joint, um, previously the British JBJS in 2013. And they were very keen on the use of this vascular investigation because it was non-invasive and it was an extra step to decide who may need a, a surgical exploration and who may not. So this can be a value. So my further assertion is that the pulseless supracondylar humeral fracture patient is an epidemiologically distinct subgroup of patients who are at higher risk for a permanent irreversible complication, especially when that complication is not treated early. So you have to find it early if you have any hopes. They deserve increased attention aimed at minimizing the risk of this Volkman's ischemic contracture. Early success fixes most of these pulseless patients. This is another important point that Dr. Skaggs has already touched on. This is an awesome paper by Dr. Skaggs group out of Los Angeles. About 75% of the time, if you have an otherwise pink or perfused and pulseless supracondylar, three quarters of them get their pulse back just by you doing your job. So I agree, I agree completely with Dr. Skaggs on this concept of get it done, get it pinned, get it stable. Now the other 25% still deserve further observation and possibly further resources. Now in an even scarier subset of patients, Dr. Skaggs in a multi-center study, which does include at least a few Cincinnati patients, looked at pulseless patients, now a mixture of perfused and some not so perfused, but all of these patients had a median and or at least an AIN palsy. And some, some of them had a full, what we like to call a high median nerve palsy. In over half of this cohort, the pulse came back with close reduction and pinning. But it is noteworthy that at least one of those patients where, the, the, where there was a, at least initial return of pulse did turn into a full-fledged compartment syndrome about nine hours later and required further treatment. This nerve business deserves some other attention to detail. There's the okay sign where your AIN is working and the not okay. When you think <laughs> you are seeing an AIN palsy, you need to make sure that it is only an AIN palsy. So the very next test to do is to look for high median nerve function. With virtually no variation, the high median nerve is responsible for your sublimus function at the PIP joint. So block the other fingers. I like to see the long finger bend. When I see that bend, I like to hold the other fingers and watch a ring finger bend. Even in an injured child, sit there and hold the fingers long enough and you'll see flexion. When you see high median nerve function, that is reassuring. If the entire median nerve is asleep, there is a strong suspicion, a strong case can be made that the patient does not perceive pain the same. You have a neuropraxia and the ability to perceive pain can be altered in that patient. That makes everything even more dangerous. So every pulseless patient deserves early surgery because that restores the pulse in most and they deserve continued focused attention, often with additional consultants. Get another set of eyes, get, uh, get another colleague to weigh in on the case. So what are we really talking about as we continue to think about these pulseless supracondylars? We're worried about this guy. We are worried about Richard von Volkmann, who from the early 1870s until the 1880s had paper, papers that were published regarding this ischemic contracture. And these are ugly pictures. Some of these, it hasn't changed much in hundreds of years. It's actually stunning. We, we would like to never see this again. It's an irreversible complication that is an absolute tragedy. 
there is there's no there are are uh, there are procedures but these are procedures that may may add a little bit of function most orthopedic surgeons think that the only way to get a Volkman's ischemic contracture is via compartment syndrome acute compartment syndrome that is important that is a major way but there is also, remember the ischemic contracture. The other way is arterial compromise. I'm not talking about revascularization uh, compartment syndrome. I'm not, I'm not, I'm talking about an artery that is injured and never reopens. So from the arterial embol embolism uh, literature, as well as the supracondylar literature, there is ample evidence that, that I think we need to re-emphasize in this setting. Griffiths in 1940 in the, British literature had 32 uh, Manchester cases. The most common cause was supracondylar fracture, always disturbing. And what Griffith said, he said, how then does arterial injury sometimes produce no circulatory embarrassment, sometimes gangrene, and sometimes Volkman contracture, just as embolism? And so his answer to himself was the answer must lie in the collateral circulation. And the fact remains that all children are not at the same risk. About 25% will have significant variant anatomy. This is a study of nearly 200 cadavers getting close to 400 upper extremities. There's a difference, there's a dozen different subcategories of the anatomy of the arm. Everybody isn't the same as, as all of us learned in our respective medical schools. So the point here is every child is quite clearly not at the same risk. Kenya Suji, you gotta love a guy whose name is Kenya. Kenya Suji wrote about this in the 1975 JBJS and pointed out many of the same points that it is the deep musculature which is at highest risk. And our colleague, also the most common cause of, of Volkman's in his series, supracondylar fractures, very disturbing. Now the angiosome concept that the plastic surgery literature has told us started in 1987 with the, the authors Taylor and Palmer and they pointed out, just like there's dermatomes, there are angiosomes, where there are distinct areas. So as we're down there checking capillary refill at the fingers, and we're feeling a pulse up here to make us more or less frightened, what we are really concerned about is the deep bowler compartment. We're concerned about this sensitive tissue, the flexor digitorum profundus, et cetera. And most of this, the pink stuff, is very dependent on the ulnar branch of the brachial artery, big deal. The angiosome concept is an important, we should push all of our trainees to pull and study and read these articles. The radial side collaterals are more robust, the owner side collaterals less robust, big deal. So there's also additional confusion regarding the implications of pulselessness. This was the study we published in the JPO some years ago, we summarized the literature at the time and we said following a closed reduction and internal fixation, so now we're a step beyond Dr. Skagg's paper. The patient has been reduced and stably inter and hopefully anatomically fixed. Then we asked our colleagues, if it's pulseless, what percentage of them do you think? And our colleagues thought there was a very low rate of real injury to the artery. The literature says it was in excess of 80%. We asked our colleagues, the, the fracture is pinned and reduced. And now we say it's pink and pulseless. What do you think the rate of real artery injury is? Now they said an even lower number. The literature still had a substantially higher number based on published reports. And then perhaps some of this freight, some of this, these concepts were influenced by our perception of the success of exploration and or brachial artery repair. We asked our colleagues, what do you think the success rate is if somebody has to fix an artery? And they said, oh, about half the time. And the literature, even including some of the, of the older papers with lower rates, the, the pooled meta-analysis meta puts put success well in excess of 91%. So as we wrap up here with these last several slides, we're going to show at least this case example. This is a 10-year-old who fell on an outstretched hand at wrestling practice, and he had a type 3 supracondylar. This is the actual poor outside x-ray, and notice, what direction is this supracondylar displaced? It's an extension type, which is displaced posterolaterally. Thank you, Dr. Hadley Miller and Dr. Georgeopoulos out of, out of Colorado. This is as soon as I see a posterolateral, I start to worry more. 
The kid had a bunch of scary phraseology in the chart, weak pulses, dusky and cool. It terrified the outside institution. The child was rapidly transferred to the children's hospital. At the children's hospital, uh, the pucker sign was noted that Dr. Skaggs described very nicely. And this child went to surgery less than three hours after coming to my hospital, less than five hours after injury. This is early, early treatment by anyone's definition in the literature. Um, the, the surgeons of record did a milking maneuver to make that pucker go away. They got a wonderful anatomic reduction. Dr. Skagg should be very pleased with pin spread. There's three pins in a type three. He should be ecstatic. Uh, the child has a nice fitting uh, a cast. We do not have the children's Los Angeles foam on there, but we have a stretch relax technique and a safely applied cast. And now no one can feel a pulse because they put on a cast and there's no access to even feel, but we keep looking at cap refill. The nurse is happy with cap refill. The others that have assessed the patient are happy with cap refill. The child did have some motor neuropraxias, but not high median nerve. His high median nerve was fine. And sensation, these were motor only. So this may have been due to pain sensation was intact within all of his described dermatomes. And he went home on narcotic pain medication. Two days later, he represents with increasing pain. So what, what I tell my uh, residents or your registrars based on those that are listening, I go, what should you do when the patient bounces back and you see them in the emergency room? I said, you should have a change of underwear because you should poop your pants. You should be terrified. A bounce back is a bad thing trying to happen. And you have to have a low threshold to do everything you can to, to help keep anything bad from happening. The patient represented, re they were evaluated by the surgeon of record, the cast was removed, the compartments were inspected. There was this very creepy phrase in the note, clawing of fingers were noted, a slightly looser cast was applied. They were very happy with the capillary refill. There was actually no mention in the chart of the radial pulse but the compartments were deemed soft. They were deemed uh, not, you know, not at all suspicious by a board certified orthopedic surgeon. A week later, the child, and dutifully recorded in the chart are the nursing records, the visual analog scale, the patient is feeling better. Now the visual analog scale is only a four. At two weeks later, the visual analog scale is only a one. And that's because the tissue was progressively more and more dead. There was less ability to perceive pain. Dr. Von Volkman came to visit. This is the last full-fledged Volkman's ischemic contracture that occurred at my hospital. This is getting close to 20 years old now, and we hope to keep it that way. And as I like to point out, look how amazing that capillary refill is. Even with the arm, with the forearm completely dead, right? A full-fledged Volkman's, the capillary refill is still awesome. And so my point is that at the front end, we need more evaluation. Was this a brachial artery? Was this a selective ulnar branch injury to his deep bowler compartment? And everything in that angiosome paid the price. Um, those are my questions. We'll leave it at that because time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Melman. Uh, thank you for raising the issue of angiosomes and I think it's important for everybody to realize that uh, the arterial injury is higher than we think it is. It's not only about uh, survival of the limb or gangrene, but it's about Folkman's ischemic contracture that we should worry about, the muscle blood flow. I think that was the point. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, so, Taral, uh, if for next five minutes, if there are any mm -hmm. audience questions, we'll take that before I go to cases. Absolutely. Am I being heard? Uh, yes. Is the sound clear? So, Sandeep? Okay. So I'm yes, yes, we can hear this, you. Uh, questions which I mean, yeah, some questions which have been coming from audience, but I just mentioned that this is an international conference because 80 international uh, registrations we have, I think, from USA all the way to Australia. And uh, good afternoon, good evening, good night to some people here. Questions here uh, for Dr. X. How do you check nerve in an infant or a small child, especially when the child is crying, not cooperative? What do you do? 
Yeah, it is difficult to check the nerves on a crying infant. And the truth is that maybe you won't be able to. Um, one of the tricks, if it's really important to know, is you could put the hand soaked in a wet washcloth and see where the skin wrinkles. Um, if the skin wrinkles everywhere, you know that at least sensation is intact everywhere. And sometimes you can see the skin not wrinkling where the nerve is injured. Um, but the, I really, you know, to be honest, you can't always say for certain that you can test all the nerves of an infant. A lot of it is observation. Okay. Uh, Taran, next question. Yeah, next question. Cheetah? Yeah. So there are many questions about pinning. Yes, Sita, you wanted to say something, please. Yeah, I have a question for Dr. Skaggs. Um, you know, actually I've got two questions. One is that, uh, you know, we teach the residents now that the pronation supination thing that you talked about may not be as important if you're pinning all supracondylar fractures. My question is how important do you feel because we just keep the arm in a neutral position after pinning and we have not noticed clinically any issues, you know, uh, keeping it in pronation supination and my, Second question. Um, Actually, can we do one at a time? So, uh, okay, so I find right. it easier. Yes. Yeah, okay. I, I love your idea of casting it in a neutral position. Um, I think that's good for many reasons. If you're doing extreme comp uh, supination or pronation, I think it puts more kind of vascular stress in the muscle, and I think you're risking compartment syndrome more. So I love the idea of casting in a neutral position. And I think the pronation and supination are important concepts when you're trying to do the closed reduction, yes. probably a little bit less important when you're casting. You know, you should be holding the reduction with the metal, not the position of supination or pronation. So I think yeah, you're pronation, exactly Pronation and supination correct. are reduction tactics. And when, once right. you get it reduced and then stably fixed, it's a moot point. Absolutely. Okay. So okay, let's have the next one. Thank you. And the next thing is, do you treat all cubitus varus with an osteotomy? Or is there, like, how do you judge when you have cubitus varus? How do you say, okay, this is acceptable. This is only like five degrees, but this is not acceptable. Because patients, most of the time, are asymptomatic. They just come in because either they have a deformity or they have, you know, they are curious to know, you know, if this is okay. And so you can walk, you know, you can talk them out of surgery that this is not going to be an issue. It's not going to progress. Or you can just say, we have to do an osteotomy. How do you talk about, you know, mild cubitus varus versus, you know, severe deformity? So well, the answer is I do what the patients want to do. But the issues are, one, sometimes it is painful. Um, so if it really is painful, then I think that it could often be improved with the osteotomy. But in general, it's not painful. In general, it's simply a cosmetic deformity. There are some reports that you're going to be more at risk for a lateral condyle fracture if the kid falls on it, but I frame it that it is generally a cosmetic deformity, and if it doesn't bother you, it doesn't bother me. So I really have to have the patient or family asking me to do the surgery. Otherwise, I don't think it needs to be done. Now, I think if the surgery is done by a surgeon and at a center where you do it on a regular basis, I think that the surgery could have predictable good results. Um, so if the patients want it, happy to do it, but I never talk them into it. Okay. No, it's not uh, completely that's... cosmetic. I mean, there's a rate of tardy ulnar nerve palsy. Sean O'Driscoll has said perhaps posterior lateral rotatory instability and also an increased risk of lateral condyle fracture. So I, I, I respect what you're saying. It, it may offer very little functional problem, but there's, there's a few things on the list for us to mention to them about trouble. Uh, there are a yeah, few it, questions it, to Dr. Melman uh, uh, around the vascular status of the limb. What is your incidence of doing an open reduction for type 3 and vascular repair when you have an absent pulse with a pink hand? Do you think that that should be done each and every time to prevent Folkman's? No, and that's not my message at all. So that's where most people have great pushback to think, oh, I, I'm supposed to explore every one of these. My message is much simpler and I, and I think easy to agree to. And that is that we should worry more and do some additional studies. I, there's a Ruben So's pulse oximeter waveform. There's Doppler duplex analysis. There's consult another colleague, a hand surgery colleague or a vascular surgeon who has some comfort going the next step. Um, 
my personal favorite is the Doppler duplex study. And when I see a brachial artery uh, occlusion, uh, even in the setting of that, of that perfused hand, those 100% uh, of those have been uh, explored. I could show seven more examples of that with the Doppler, with the Doppler findings. Okay, so your threshold for exploration is lower if you can document a lesion in a better way rather than just relying on perfusion. Correct, and by the same token, I've had some pulseless kids where I was very worried. We get the intraoperative Doppler duplex and they show me the whole vascular tree. They show me the brachial artery, they show me the bifurcation, they follow it down the forearm. The, the, the technology is amazing. It shows you the direction of the flow and so I say, oh, this is actually spasm. This is arterial spasm because everything is still flowing. And that's a patient that I have comfort waking them up and then continuing to watch them closely. When I get the reading that says okay. something like no flow in the brachial artery, you know, no significant flow yeah. at the wrist, uh, that ch those children get explored. Okay, so there are a lot of questions on pinning configurations and uh, organ spin, et cetera. I think we will take them with the cases because we have cases where we will talk about pins. So I think I will start sharing the screen and we will go to the cases so that uh, we can... Uh... Are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. So, yes, so what we are... Yeah, it is full screen. Can you see it? Yes. 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 Uh, okay. So what we hope to achieve through this cases is look at some disasters, try to point out reasons why they happen and suggest some solutions. So this is an eight-year-old uh, girl who had a fall and was treated as a type one supracondyl in a slab. So I would ask Mandar, uh, do you think that uh, a slab is good enough treatment for this? Yes, so looking at it primarily, yeah. So can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Manda, go ahead. Yes, uh, yes, so go looking ahead. Looking at it primarily, it looks fairly okay. Uh, but uh, the only worry, uh, so I'd like to give him, give her a cast, but uh, keep her under close follow up. Okay, okay. So this was treated in a slab. And at two months follow-up, this is what happened. So, uh, Dr. Melman, if you can comment what really happened and did we miss a trick here? Well, all, all I can say is uh, thank you for sharing. We all learn from cases like this. When you look at the injury film, you can look back and say that's a, that's a faint amount of medial impaction. Um, okay, and yeah. If you could manipulate the image enough, maybe you'd convince yourself that you see cortical violation even on that. But that still meets the definition of a type one. You can have a complete undisplaced fracture and that's still a type one. Um, so I don't, I don't know, maybe this is the one that should have been hyper pronated, you know, in the cast. <laughs> yeah. our, our, I think our, it's our, important to pay attention to the pillar combination. Dr. Skaggs? So I think anytime there's medial comminution like that, I would recommend pinning it. Um, and okay. as Dr. Melman pointed out, you want to do extreme pronation to help, but more importantly, during surgery, fully extend the arm and push valgus. And I find you have to push so much valgus, you're almost afraid you're going to break the arm. And I think that there is so little risk in pinning it, and this could have been avoided if it was pinned. You know, now she okay. will need a much bigger operation. Operation. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is uh, this is uh, another example, a nine-year-old which was treated again in a cast, thinking this is just a type two injury and ended up with a similar bad result. So I guess we all of us agree that it's important to pay attention to combination and uh, stability because these can easily drift into virus. Well, uh, this is a place. This is a place where you can make the case that our the way that we apply the classification system influences the surgeon's urge to treat. So to call that a type two leads you down a path. If you go back to the injury film for a moment, I don't think we should ever call that a type two. 
my my practical definition uh, is that if the only thing that you're doing is flexing the arm up to increase your intersection of anterior humeral line, then I think you just reduced to type two. If you are yes. doing any varus valgus moment, any translational stuff, you are not reducing a type two. You're reducing a type three. Absolutely. I, may, so may I make a comment here? I think yeah. Dr. Melman is absolutely correct that we should think of as a type two fracture as only an anterior posterior deformity, no more than that. Once you show that there's deformity in the frontal plane, it is now a type three fracture. Absolutely. The error I think is looking at the lateral and thinking that the posterior cortex is intact. Whereas the AP gives you the clue that it is translated. So that's why I like to emphasize the practical definition of not the radiographic, but the practical definition of what's a two, what's a three is based on what did it take to reduce it? Okay, uh, so let's move on. This is a type three fracture and this is how it was pinned. So Dr. Ajay Singh, if I can have your comments on, uh, is this good pinning? Is it uh, bad pinning and what are the errors? If you can point out for all the trainees and residents, what has gone wrong? Because people think, oh, Dr. Uh, Skax told us supraconductor three pins. I put three pins. Yes, uh, though the number is three is is fine, but the placement of uh, as uh, uh, already has been discussed that uh, at least the span between the two pins uh, should be uh, around the one third of the total the fracture uh, fracture surface. Uh, so on that plane. Uh, it is not very appropriate. And secondly, on the medial aspect, there is some cognition. I'm not sure whether, uh, I mean, this uh, is going to give you stability as such without the medial pin. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Skaggs, any comments on the way it has been pinned? Yes. So, it's interesting that some people will blame this on lateral pinning. And some people will say, this is why we need to do a medial pin. In my opinion though, this was just a poor technique of lateral pinning. So this is not a failure of the concept of lateral pinning. This is just the lateral pins weren't done correctly. They have to be separated at the fracture site and they weren't here. Okay, yeah, two what's it, may be entering an opinion the about site. the, uh, is there an opinion about the four cortex pin? Because there were a few questions about the four cortex pin. Um, do you recommend it? Most of the times it should go through the fossa, one of the pins. I think going through the fossa is great because you just add two more cortices. I see no downside to it. Yeah, it's, 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 okay. it's, Does it cause it's, stiffness? Yeah. yeah. It causes stiffness when the pin is there. You know, you can't fully extend the elbow when the pin is in the olecranon fossa, but once you pull it out, it does not cause stiffness. stiffness. In fact, okay. I'd go Thank so far to say that if you're doing lateral pinning technique correctly, you have to go across the olecranon fossa. Agreed. Excellent Absolutely. Point. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So another case where again, somebody has done pins now, uh, Venkat, if you can point out the errors in this spinning technique. Um, though the reduction looked good on the uh, AP view, the lateral view, we see that the reduction is not proper. The fracture is not reduced well, and they put uh, cross pins. Yeah. So right. I think that's the so, so, so cross spinning as a concept, which is published as being biomechanically stronger, doesn't work if your reduction is not good. So the prerequisite to pinning has to be a good stable reduction to begin with. It's not the pins, it's also the reduction quality that is important. Sheetal, any points you want to make? Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, the reduction is not good. And, uh, you know, as, as Dr. Skaggs had pointed out, lateral pins work mo most of the time. But my point is, what do you do from there? So, okay, so you have lost reduction, or maybe you had good reduction, but now you've lost it, and you end up with this x-ray. If clinically the patient doesn't have cubitus varus, would you do anything at this point? And so uh, we will come to that, Cheetal. We have delayed presentation, second opinion cases later. I'll just move on yeah. here because. But uh, I want so, to ask just one question right now. Uh, if you can go back, you know. Yeah, sure. We, all, we, we are never going to be perfectly reduced. You know, I mean, I'm not saying never, 
we accept a little bit of mild reduction. We accept a little bit of a spike. We accept a little bit of rotation. Is there a way for you to judge that this is acceptable and this is not acceptable? Like when you reduce the yes. fraction? That is a great question. Um, I think we have to be simple here. There's only two things we need for a good reduction. The anterior humeral line crosses the capitellum and Bauman's angle is good. And if there's a little translation or a little spike, so what? I think that people get too complicated sometimes when this is really very simple. All right. And there is That's remodeling exactly. capacity in the sagittal plane. Right, okay. So uh, a little older child with uh, a flexion kind of injury, and I guess somebody attended an AO course. So uh, transolecran on osteotomy and bicolumn plating, do you think it's an overkill or, or uh, plating is recommended for an older child? Dr. Melman, any comments? My, my main comment is when you if the surgeon has made this decision, if, if, if for some reason you were forced or compelled, uh, when you when there's that much exposure, that much that implants implants of that magnitude, it's guaranteed stiffness is guaranteed. Guaranteed. Virtually okay. never does that child regain normal motion. Motion. So not a good idea to use so much plates. Uh, again, an older child with a comminuted fracture, multiple pins, but some. Sometimes we do get a complication like this. You see there is hypertrophic bone formation in the fossa region causing stiffness, some, some bone here. So uh, do you think uh, that older children, some kind of low profile plate is a good idea or you would still end up with putting pins in multiple directions? Well, first off here, there's that one pin that seems to be almost in the fracture site. So I'm not sure that's a yep. great pin, but I think that if one does more dissection and putting in plates, I think the chance of hypertrophic bone increases. Um, I think okay. that if you put pins in the right place to a great reduction, that minimizes the chance of hypertrophic reduction, assuming that this was done closed. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, did this child have an open reduction? No, it was a closed reduction. Very interesting. That's an immensely unusual, I mean, call it yeah. hypertrophic bone. It's not quite heterotopic ossification. That's immensely unusual. Okay. Is, this, is there any, was there any evidence of infection or anything? Uh, uh, no, no, infection? not really. No infection. Did the, did the child have a head injury? No, no. It was an isolated trauma. Yeah, there's something odd here. I don't think yeah. that this is a result of mistreatment of the supracondylar fracture. I don't understand it. It's All a right. spontaneous uh, yes, osteochondroma. They... <laughs> now, I'll, I'll just make one point, uh, Sandeep, that, you know, we just can't go by the age of the patient. I've treated like 14-year-old supracondylar just like I would treat a five-year-old. Yep. And I've, okay. I've opened, opened, reduced, and treated a 12-year-old because it looked like an adult <laughs> pattern of injury. So my take on this is you need to differentiate supracondylars an adult type versus a typical kid type. If they have a simple you know, uh, hyperextension type supracondylar fracture, just like you would see in a five-year-old. I would treat him, even a 14-year-old with, uh, with just lateral pinning, and I've had, you know, good results with that. But sometimes okay. in a 12-year-old with an adult pattern, you have a T-condylar, you have more combination, then you have to do something more. So I think age may not be the only way to decide, like, at what age you're going to transition from pins to plates. I think you need plates, to Plates, yeah. Is, yeah. is there some guideline? Yeah. I would, as I said, an adult pattern would need an adult type of treatment. Doesn't matter what the age, like, you know, after like 10 years of age, I'd rather go with what pattern of fracture they have. If it, if it seems like more than an adult pattern, you would try and treat it like an adult supercon. Okay, so something like this, you would probably plate it, Sheetan? Yeah, I think that this one, I don't know the age of the patient, but this one looks like it's, you know, I, you can certainly try with the pin, but there is there is more combination here on the medial side. I would, you know, be, be a little bit more concerned, you know. So, and so, a, so somebody, as you, yeah, there is an intercondylar element there in this. Right. Yes. This this is not a supracondylar fracture. Once you have the intraarticular component, we should not think of it as a supracondylar fracture. This is a whole different ballgame. Yeah. Right. 
so what happened was this was assumed as a supracondylar and this is how it was pinned and it ended up uh, with healing but if you can see one part of it was flexed and he came with a flexion deformity and stiffness yeah so in fractures like this the intraarticular component and he ended up stiff yeah. sorry go on i'm just most... rushing through some slides no please go ahead with your comments i am just skipping a few slides Oh, I said the most important thing when you have an intraarticular fracture is to get the articular surface together. And it looks like that was not done in that case. Yes. Yeah, I call, I call the T intercondylar my least favorite pediatric fracture because it is so <laughs> difficult to get a great result. Every child ends up with some stiffness. So I yes. think... Uh... Uh, like Sheetal has pointed out, we have to look at the fracture pattern and combination, the assessment of stability, your training technique and pin patterns. How do you tackle the large swelling and what is blocking your reduction? I think those are the important points. So I, as we had said, we'll discuss late presenters. So this is the story of a young boy who had a fall while playing and a swollen elbow. Now, I will go through case scenarios here. He had a fall while playing, was advised surgery, close reduction, but he go, went away to a local bone setter and did massage uh, uh, and some splint was applied and he came back after 10 days. And that was his picture with some new bone formation here. So the question is, after 10 days, when they come late, what happens? And if we can have a quiz here, what are you going to do? Ashok, can you run the quiz here? So I'll go back to the slide. It's a 10 day old injury and somebody has done massage. Could you maybe educate me and what is massage? I don't understand. So, so we have these local traditional bone setters. They would do a rubbing motion to try to set it. They do a lot of rubbing of the elbow and tie it tightly with local cloth and put some wooden sticks. So it sounds like that would hurt if somebody's rubbing a fresh fracture. And yeah, so that does not happen. So set them up for a compartment syndrome. Yes, that does happen quite a lot. So uh, we have 19% who still want to try a close reduction. 10% want to try some percutaneous method. 24% would go for an open reduction. And 47% are going to leave it for remodeling, okay? So let's see what happened. Okay, so again, this is another case which Sheetal was alluding to a late presenter, fall while playing, swollen elbow, advised surgery, has undergone surgery. Now this is the picture. And now he has come to you for a second opinion at the end of three weeks. So are you going to intervene? Would you revise this, uh, Dr. Skaggs? Any opinion here? Uh, so first off, this is not a good reduction. It looks like there's a huge amount of rotation. Um, at 21 days, I think that there's so much bone formation that we cannot open it up and make it perfect. So I would allow for six to 12 months to see how things go. If the patient okay. needs an osteotomy, we want to wait a while. Okay, so you can accept the malunion. Right you would accept the malunion? At this point, yes, and observe. Yes. Okay, you wouldn't open, reduce, and try to get it right radiologically? Not at 21 days. I would do that at 10 days, but at 21 days, okay. I don't think it would be helpful. Chuck, I'd like to hear your opinion. Okay. I'm curious. I'm in complete agreement with my Los Angeles colleague. Um, the child is, I mean, I, the part of the speech to the parents would be trusting mother nature. And if at the I should end put of up the one, quiz, if at the end of one year, we were unhappy an osteotomy would still be possible. You know, and for all the residents who are listening, um, I love doing this because I love learning from Chuck. And even though we may be considered experts, uh, it's really good to keep learning from each other and questioning each other. And sometimes when we question each other, it's done from a place of learning, not trying to be, you know, egos and saying who's the smartest. 
Yeah. So I guess our audience also about 80, 80% plus want to leave it alone. And uh, 11% want to open, reduce and realign. And a uh, few of them, 7% are saying, just remove the wires and leave them alone. Nobody for plating, thank God. So, so let me go back to what happened to those kids. So that this was the scenario. The first child, Dr. Skaggs, the one which I showed who had massage, that is local rubbing treatment. This is how we ended up. The entire myositis and complete bone bridging across the brachialis. And this, wow. this is what he ended up and came to me with a to totally stiff elbow with complete bone formation in the entire brachialis. And the other guy underwent a late open reduction. Somebody decided that he needs to put it right radiologically. So midline posterior approach, tricep splitting, and they got a perfect X-ray. Again, a stiff elbow, scar, adhesions, and myositis. So disasters do happen, and it's best that we learn from them that these are things that should not be done. Whereas in our country, if you add infection to that, Okay, another case where a late open reduction was done and it got infected and the child ended up totally stiff with uh, chondrolysis. So that is another devastation that can happen. Whereas simply the wires were removed in this particular case and it was left for remodeling. And as you said, waiting pays and it remodeled quite well and he had a decent function. So yeah, leaving it alone right. made sense rather than trying to do any kind of heroic surgery when they present late. So the message is, uh, that slide? Uh, yes. So I think here, you know, let's be simple. It looks like Bauman's angle is kind of okay. And it looks like the anterior humeral line kind of touches the capitellum. So by our very simple criteria, we predict that this should be okay. Yeah, that's right. So, so the message I guess is that uh, over 10 days old fractures ideally should not be open reduced, especially if repeated manipulations or local massage has been done or somebody has already operated and with fever, if they have fever or a high CRP or alkaline phosphatase, sometimes that's a harbinger for infection and myositis. So best leave them alone rather than touch them. And midline posterior approach has been pointed out earlier by Dr. Skaggs too is a bad idea, a transverse anterior incision is a, a better way of doing an open reduction. So there are a few per... One yeah. question for you. So do you yeah. get blood work on these patients? Why do you even get the blood work, like the CRP and alkaline phosphatase? Or is no, there any... uh, to rule out infection, because a lot of these kids with massage also may be having infection. A high CRP and fever or warmth... It, it could, and alkaline phosphate is one of the indicators which suggest early uh, myositis. Regarding so, the open reduction when, technique, there is a paper out of Turkey, out of Ankara by Kizile, uh, that added further negative feedback on that tricep splitting posterior approach. But I, I would submit to you that the anterior approach, that, that's reserved for our you know, vascular concerns by and large. And most surgeons will just have comfort with either a pure lateral or a pure, pure medial approach. Um, my, my, uh, my program director was Alvin Crawford. He taught me to favor the medial approach because it's more cosmetic. You're, you're likely to want uh, crossed pins because uh, when you open a supracondylar, it does not get more stable. It becomes even floppier. Okay. Okay. Good so point, I yeah. just... I'll just run through some percutaneous techniques which have been described. So, uh, Dr. Taral, I'm, this is his case, uh, close reduction done somewhere else. This is acute. And he came to him after eight days with a little blistering in the front and a displaced fracture. So, around eight to ten days, what he did was he used an artery forcer. And you can see he's used a leverage technique and a joystick k wire in the proximal fragment to get a reduction. So if it is a, a relatively uh, fresh fracture within a week to 10 days and nobody else has manipulated it too much, probably a leverage technique like this may work and get you a satisfactory alignment. Uh, but the best approach would be to wait for a year, as Dr. Skag said, wait for remodeling and try to treat the sequelae, which is uh, cubitis virus, or if there is myositis, a stiff elbow, 
which can be corrected in the way you want. So I'll just rush through these slides. This is a Premal's case where he had an anterior bone block. After remodeling, he went ahead and excised that and he's demonstrated the hypertrophic median nerve there. He excised that and got improvement in the range of motion. But again, this is late surgery at the end of one year after remodeling is complete. Uh, so that is how they should be managed. And this is the child with the myositis, which I excised through an anterior approach. And he got some functional range of motion from a totally stiff elbow. So open surgery with extensive dissection while biology is active is not a good idea. It causes new bone formation. And percute techniques may be tried if they are fresh. And uh, realignment by osteotomy or arthrolysis nine months to one year after the late presentation is safer and better. So let me hand over to Mandar for his first case. Mandar, can yeah. you go live? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, so um, this is my first case. This is um, 10 p.m. on a Saturday. I got a call from um, a very senior pediatrician. And um, his nephew had fallen down, had a displaced fracture around the elbow. And I was quite happy to hear that because he was a very senior pediatrician. He had referred a case to me. And I said, oh, must time to earn some brownie points. So I got those, uh, I saw the child. He had dinner at 9 p.m. And immediately after that, he had a fall. And he was admitted at 10.30 p.m. So he was not, uh, his starvation was not complete. He had severe swelling, has a deep pucker sign. His distal pulsations were present a bit feeble and hand was warm and pink. Um, as with many patients in India, there were at least 10 relatives in the room at that time. The, the <laughs> child was howling, the mother was wailing, and it was very difficult for me to examine his neurology. And this was uh, the x-ray. Posterior lateral. Yeah, so it was a posterior lateral uh, injury. It was, uh, and I thought that, well, it was, it is fine. Uh, this was around 10.30 p.m. at night. And uh, can I go to the next slide, please? Yeah, and um, I was very much impressed by this paper and uh, by Dr. Melman and uh, about the surgical timing. And that he said that uh, we can wait on till early next morning. So it was around 11 p.m. We were not starving. So I took him up at around 6 a.m. At 6 a.m., just before the OT, I could not feel the pulse. The child was fairly comfortable with a, with a posterior slab at around 30 degrees flexion, but I could not feel the pulse. Uh, he had probably a median nerve palsy. Again, a very young child, I could not examine him very well. He had a dense pucker with a deep contusion here. I tried to, to uh, milk the pucker sign, but it was not milkable. And uh, I tried a few joystick maneuvers, could not, could not be reduced. Now we are at 6 a.m. in the morning. Now this is, these are some practical scenarios which we have to deal with in India, where it's a small nursing home where we are, we are, we are treating. Uh, we have failed close reduction. We probably have a median nerve palsy and a pink pulseless hand. And uh, so what do we do? So uh, I wanted to ask uh, Professor Skaggs as well as Dr. Menmal, in a pink pulseless hand, do you have a your vascular colleague on standby or, or how, do you, how do you go about it? And how much percentage of uh, patients do you require a vascular surgeon to be uh, available? Uh, so I would say that, could, would you mind going back to two slides? I think it would be good to talk about it there. Perfect, right there. So what... Oh, can you do the one where you showed the elbow, please? Yeah. Yes, perfect. So one could imagine right there that the artery and the median nerve is tented over the proximal fragment. If the closed reduction has failed, we have to do an open reduction. I personally like doing the transverse incision because it heals so wonderfully with such a great scar, but more importantly, it gets you right to what you need to see. Um, and I would propose that if you do that and then get the artery and nerve out of the way and do your reduction, the great majority of the time you do not need a vascular surgeon there. Because most of the time, simply getting the artery out of the way and flexing up the elbow should return uh, the pulse and should return good vascularity. If it doesn't, if you still have a white hand, that's when we call in vascular surgery. 
But I think it's very important that this patient is treated immediately locally in that hospital, even if a vascular surgeon isn't available. Because if you leave them like that and take six hours to go to another hospital, they can get a compartment syndrome. Yeah. yeah so, um, yes, Dr. Sheetal. No, Chuck, is, uh, Chuck, you need to unmute. We can't unmute hear you. yourself. Thanks. I would also add that because of the presentation with the brachialis sign, and it, there was not a totally normal vascular exam at presentation. This is not a child that is covered by the let's splint them and do the case tomorrow. Yeah. You know, the <laughs> paper published in like the eight similar papers since then um, have made the same point. Yeah. All bets are off when there are any such questions about vascularity, um, for sure. So, so two points, Mandar, I'll just make two quick points here. One is that, you know, I would not be concerned about the NPO status of a patient. That should not get be get in yes. the way of your decision-making for a, for a post less supraconder with a pucker. And okay. the second thing is, if you read that paper, a lot of those patients were reduced, just pulled upon. The elbow was pulled in the ED so that you don't end up with significant deformity sitting overnight. So if you have a post less with a deformity, you can pull it in the ED and relax it like, you know, uh, like Chuck's paper did, and uh, you know, Skaggs had mentioned that in the in the uh, in the beginning, like you can just pull on it. So I would not sit on a post list just because he had just eaten. You know, yeah. uh, I would I would consider that. To be tell, could I make a point? I think what you said is so right and so important. So even if there's just a pucker sign, that means we should be doing that soon. We don't care about the NPO status. Very important point. So, okay, Amanda. Uh, yeah, I did an open direction anteriorly. I took a transverse incision and I extended it sl slightly upwards medially. Uh, thankfully, the as uh, uh, Dr. Skag said, the 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 pucker was right there and the proximal spike was right there, and I could get a good reduction. Can I go to the next slide, please? Yeah, I could get a good reduction and uh, next and fixed it uh, in a standard manner. This was the incision. Can I go, go ahead? So I added a third pin just for this. See, so I just analyzed this fracture just just uh, because I so yeah. So should I have anticipated it? And so if I analyze the fracture, can I go ahead? Yeah. So so I could see that the spike of the medial fragment was extremely sharp. And there is a very nice paper uh, coming from Singapore, I think. Next, next slide, uh, by Lim et al., which showed the showed the importance of the medial spike, where they said that if the medial spike angle is less than 45 degrees, uh, or if like this, or if the tip skin distance is less than about six millimeters, then you have to be very careful and and anticipate that you may have some problems intraoperatively. Next. Yeah, so learning points is that always do a near, detailed neurological exam, think of vascular entrapment, look closely at the x-ray and beware of the medial spike. So, yeah. so can I go to the next slide? Uh, we'll go to the next case. No? Yeah. So it, this is the next case, Manda. Yeah. yeah. So this is a case contributed by Dr. Sandeep Vaidya. Uh, he, uh, this was an eight-year-old boy, had a fall while playing and had a right fracture supracondyl humerus. Now, is this okay, a run-of-the-mill supracondyl? Or... Yeah, can we have the pole? Yeah. What is the preferred pin configuration for this fracture? Cross spinning, two lateral K wires, three lateral or a Dorgan spin from medial? Right, so three lateral K wires is overwhelming favorite, fifty-eight percent. Cross spinning, twenty-eight uh, percent. That's how people have voted. So, Mandar, if you can go ahead. Yeah, can I go ahead? Yeah. So um, this was operated somewhere else, and uh, can I go ahead? Yeah, this was what was done. So they did a combination of a few lateral pins and uh, 
an attempted probably an attempted organ spin and this was what was done and in fact it was done by an open reduction by a posterior approach uh we can go ahead now yeah so the kys were removed at 4 weeks and they started with physiotherapy now the the problem comes now where then they noticed the deformity at the fracture site about 2 weeks after ky removal and this was it this so this is about 6 weeks post op and has a significant hyperextension deformity yeah so can i go back to the slide yeah so this is about 12 months post op with this deformity almost a 20 degrees hyperextension with significantly restricted flexion so how much can we wait for a hyperextension deformity to remodel is the question so so why did this happen first dr skags a document yes could you please go back to the slides showing the intraoperative pinning Can you see them? Yes. So I'm not convinced that all of those pins are getting two cortices. I, I think that this is a failure of correct pinning. I um, I'm not able to draw on the screen, but it looks to me like that horizontal pin probably does not have cortex above and below the fracture site, and then the upper lateral pin looks like it's not capturing enough of the distal fragment. So I think yeah, that I, this is not not yeah. good pinning, and it fell into more extension. I think the teaching point we've seen a couple of these cases now, where on some static image, the surgeon convinced themselves that they were happy, and that's as David said earlier. I, I like the, the choice of words. If it's going to fall apart, you want it to fall apart in front of you in the OR or sleep where you can fix it. So live CR inflection extension, maybe an internal rotation stress test, as the Vanderbilt group. has written about in JPO. Yeah, Chuck, you're right. If that x-ray was stressed intraoperatively, I bet you it would have been noted that it fell apart and there was motion then. So the next question is this is about 12 months post op. He has significantly yeah. restricted flexion. And Yeah, it's a year out. Do the osteotomy now. This will not remodel. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. so that is what was done uh, distal humeral flexion osteotomy was done again k wires were fixed and removed at around 6 weeks and uh, let me go ahead and he had a fairly good uh, result post operatively this is about four to five months so just to base uh, this on uh, professor skags uh, paper in jco 2011 would you be I kind enough to go back one slide please So let's point out here even though that looks kind of funny if we go by our two rules the anterior humeral line crosses the capitellum Bauman's angles okay excellent clinical results well done right, right. so great points so basically hyperextension malunion of more than 20 degrees is something which we need to look at which which may not remodel is what uh, was given yeah thank you right so let's move on to the next set of cases by venkat das so venkat uh, over yeah. to you yeah sanip i'm ready so, so you can put the first yes. case with the yeah this is the first case eight year old boy uh, who had a <clears throat> fallen out <coughs> outstretched hand yeah we have a quiz for this yeah so go ahead sanip all of you get ready yeah what is the type of the fracture type 1 type 2 type 3 or flexion type Is there any way you can show the fracture so the yeah, participants could look thanks Right so all I can say is 19% people are asleep Eighteen <laughs> percent. Okay, go ahead, uh, Sandeep. Please. So this is a flexion type of uh, supracondylar humerus fracture. We, uh, Dr. Skaggs, has represented that about two percent of uh, supracondylar humerus could be flexion type. It's more common in older kids, and uh, the more important point is uh, sometimes they might require open reduction, and you need to counsel the parents beforehand that you might have to uh, open the uh, fracture site to get the good reduction. So next slide. 
So this was the intraoperative uh, CM picture. That's the AP view, and that's the lateral view. I was attempting a close reduction for this uh, particular uh, patient, and uh, this we could see that the proximal fragment is completely uh, rotated. So I place a, a derotation wire in the proximal fragment and uh, go ahead, Sandeep. I was uh, lucky enough to get a good close reduction just by rotating the proximal fragment to align with the distal fragment. That was the kind of reduction which I was able to get. So is Next this an Sandeep. extension, Venkat? Yes. Yeah, I think that's important that you can get control over the proximal fragment and then against that you have extended it. Yes. Yeah, I call so it the after inverse, placing the inverse of the flexion type supracondylar. Everything is nearly everything is opposite, and your landmarks are dramatically different from the hyperflex position of a of an extension type. All right. So go ahead. Uh, we place the first pin, and uh, you can see that there is a small fragment anteriorly. I mean, Sunny, you can point out the fragment anteriorly. Yeah, so that yeah. was a surprise, yeah. actually, intraoperatively. There was a fragment anteriorly. What do you think, Dr. Skax? Uh, what should we do at this point? Um, as long as the anterior humeral line crosses the capitellum and Bauman's angle is intact, you're fine. Now, there, also, that may cause a problem with ossification in the future, but I would not necessarily at this time do an open you know, removal or a reduction. So go back to the I've AP seen that fragment. Sandeep. I've made that fragment. I've watched it completely resorb over time. Okay, but that was a medial, actually, it is a medial epicondyl fragment in this patient. Go back. Oh. Sandeep, uh, go forward, Sandeep. Next slide, next slide. Go back. So that was the medial side fragment. Which I, the fragment was palpable on the medial side. I could feel it with the wire. I just reduced it to the wire. So I was able to get a good re acceptable reduction on the medial side. And uh, I was prepared to open actually, but uh, I, I was uh, there was no need to open because I was able to feel the fragment pushing it back. It fell in place, and I just proceeded with the medial wire and pinned it. Was the ulnar nerve okay, Venkat? Yeah, Allah knows. Okay, uh, this was done about six years back. The patient is doing well now. Uh, Preoperatively, no, no injury, and even postoperatively, there was no problems at all. Well, that so is I just wanted to ask the uh, panelists if, yeah, if some of you have come across this, uh, any of any one of you have come across this combination. So no, I tried to I search not. the literature that it's not reported in uh, literature yet. Uh, flexion types of proconylar humerus is a Abel's medial epicondyle. And Wait, can you uh, stop right now? Is this the case that we're talking about? This one right here? Yes. Yes. I mean, it looks to me like the medial epicondyle is in place there. Intact, yeah. That's what I'm saying. In the preoperative x-ray, I was not able to appreciate the fragment at all. It was appreciable only so, in the So here's my question. Yes. If, if it was intact <laughs> on that x-ray, I'm questioning how do we know that that the fragment that you got really was a medial picondo. I'm not because convinced that that's a medial picondo. Okay. But we can see that the fragment is moving and it disappeared in the uh, X-ray after the reduction and pinning, the post-operative X-ray. Go back, Sandeep. The fragment is not seen in this X-ray. Go back. Yeah, yeah. The lateral view. Lateral view, lateral view. The next one. Next one, next one. This one? You can't appreciate the fragment here in this X-ray. What do you think then it is? So, I mean, uh, you know, I, I agree with that. You know, I'm not really convinced, but you know, one one point, a couple of points I'll make is, you know, for a medial epicondyle fracture, we usually don't do percutaneous spinning for a displaced one. Like I agree. I and agree. It's a no and it's a medial epicondyle because you'll be concerned. You don't know where the nerve is. You know, so I would. I would be hesitant, like if you think intra-op that there was medial epicondyle, I will open up a little bit medially and make sure that the nerve is not there. Okay, so that's my first point. And the right. second is the reduction maneuver. I see that your elbow is in extension, which is how it will reduce. But we are all very familiar with pinning and flexion. So one way to do it is to put a lot of bumps underneath the arm and you can still flex it at 90 degrees and push it down. That would reduce the extent the flexion part of the fracture, but you'll be able to pin it while the elbow is in 90 degrees flexion. And that's a, that's a technique that was, uh, that has been reported. I think it was in JPOB or something. Just, it makes it a little bit easier to flex it 
put a lot of bump underneath the underneath your arm. You know, if you see right here, and you push yep. it down in 90 degrees, so it would extend your uh, your fragment, this fragment, and you will be able to get reduced and still pin it in flexion. Agree. Okay. Okay. okay let's go, go to next case. case. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Sandeep. So this is a slightly older child, a 13-year-old boy who had a fall while playing uh, cricket. And uh, he presented with the fracture of the left elbow. Go ahead, Sandeep. Next, next. So this was the kind of deformity. Uh, and that's the x-ray. Uh, Dr. Melman, go back to the x-ray, Sandeep. What would you do for this? It's a 13-year-old so boy. So of course we call it a floating elbow. I would have a very high concern of, you know, David, uh, David uh, alluded earlier to some more recent literature that says maybe the rate of compartment syndrome wasn't as high as some previous studies, but the point remains the same. We still have an increased concern. And so I would lean towards reducing and stably fixing the uh, elbow fracture first. And then almost certainly I would also reduce and pin the distal radius. So what so would your choice of, case, of implant? Yeah, choice of fixation because it's slightly and higher technique. fracture and you have a comminuted fracture. And uh, may I make a suggestion? I don't know what's going on here. It looks comminuted. My next step would be to get a CT scan yeah, with three-dimensional reconstructions. Or traction, or traction films of the existing extremity. Okay. Shital, what do you think? Do you get CT scans routinely for these patients or? No, well, no, no practice. Uh, routinely. <laughs> if I, uh, yeah, if I think there is an intraarticular uh, extension, then I would, you know, get a CT scan because that's going to change my approach. I think getting traction views and having, you know, some uh, decision making would be intra op, like, you know, uh, how the fracture falls in place once you give traction might just, you know, tell me, like, how am I going to treat it, whether I'm going to be you know, just doing K-wire, so whether I, I would open it and uh, put something across it to buttress that fragment. So I would be prepared, you know, dealing with such complex cases, I'll be prepared with different scenarios. I would not be able to tell upfront what I'm going to be doing. You know, if I can get a really good reduction and intra -op, I probably may just put K-wires and make sure it's stable. But if, I, if I'm not, I'll be, I'll just go ahead with more fixation. I'll open it and I'll fix it. So and same, I mean, the, yeah, the you, distal radius obviously needs spinning as well, the distal radius. If you, have, um, if you have stable entry points distally, our French colleagues would consider Nancy nailing. Yeah, I think a traction AP view is the next step. If you know that the joint is intact, you probably do not need a CT scan. All right. Shall I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. So I was prepared for, uh, as uh, Peter told, I counseled the parents for both uh, pinning versus open reduction. And I actually counseled them for plating as well. <coughs> Go ahead, Sandy. So we, these are the armor material which we are ready. We were ready with uh, KOS, tension nailing system, as well as the, the jet fixator is a mini external fixator system, which we have. Sometimes uh, I use it uh, for community fractures. Just if I get the alignment, uh, we do fix it with fixators. Next. So I actually, there was no intraarticular element on traction films. I didn't have the traction films put up here. So I decided to go ahead with stents. That was my first choice of fixation because I thought uh, I would be able to get a stable fixation with uh, uh, anti-grade tents here. Next. What do you think, Sheetal? The fixation is okay. Yeah, I, I think it, it looks good if you can range it and make sure it's stable. Like it's difficult for me to know exactly if the if the uh, if the nails are not uh, you know they're riding onto the posterior aspect of the column. But seems like if they are in the bone, then then it should be stable. I think okay. you have done an arthrogram. Yeah, I did an arthrogram just to make sure that there is no intraarticular uh, component, and it was the yeah. joint surface was intact, and this fixation was uh, stable enough. As Sheetal pointed out, we arranged the joint and saw that the uh, fixation was, uh, the fracture was not falling apart. And even on varus stress, it was not collapsing because the varus fragment, medial fragment, I was worried about whether it's going to cause problems. Yeah. It was quite stable. So I was happy with the fixation, proceeded with the distal radius uh, pinning with a single K-wire. Go ahead, Sandeep. Yeah. I, 
I think Jean, I think Jean Paul Medezo and Pierre Lascombs would be pleased. <laughs> yeah. So well, a couple of points I'll make. Uh, you know, we see some high supraconductive fractures, not so comminuted, but high supraconductive fractures are common uh, compared to your comminuted fractures. So you know, uh, if you try to just put lateral pins, you are going to end up the pins are going to be intramedullary a lot of times. You know, in these high supraconductive fractures. And if they are intramedullary, they are going to push your fragment medially. That means it will cause wear. So if you put a lateral pin that goes just intramedullary because of the high supraconductive fracture position, it is going to shift your fragment into wear. So I've seen that before. So one tip for to avoid that, if you're going to be doing pinning, is for this fracture, I would put a medial pin to cross it. And that, and that has been reported for high supraconductive fractures to prevent that wear. So you may want to add a medial pin to it especially if your lateral pin is going intramedullary. I don't know, you know what, stuff, but what Dave, Dave and Chuck's experience has been, but I'll just get their views as well. Shital, do you think you'll be able to secure it in the I, sense because the fracture line is running high up, very high No, up not high. in this fracture. See, this fracture is a combination as well. So not, okay. I think what you did was great. I'm just talking about the typical high supraconders, which are not combinated. All right. Yeah, I would make the okay. comment that one even could consider that this is not a supracondylar fracture. Yeah. It's not, you know, even really too close to the olecranon fossa. And I think Chatal's points are correct. So when you have this, you know, distal diaphyseal fracture, that's a time you may want to consider a medial and lateral pin that end up being intramedullary. So you could, so this is intramedullary fixation, fantastic results, congratulations. And I think one can pass the pins from the top or from the bottom, from the as long as they bottom, involve yeah. both columns. Right. Yeah, th this fracture deserves a name, right? It's not really, the nor it's certainly not a normal humeral shaft and it's not even close to a normal supracondylar. You know, there's a similar near the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction of the distal tibia that is a troublesome fracture also. Some call that one a Gillespie fracture. And so it, th this one deserves its own name. I'm not sure what we should call it though. <laughs> Okay, okay. Call it so I think here, yeah. Gartland, <laughs> Gartland 6. Okay, so that was lovely, the case. Uh, so we had a large spectrum of cases, and we are honored that I can see Dr. Professor K. Wilkins on the panel. He's joined us. So I saw him raise a hand. So Dr. Wilkins, uh, can you unmute yourself and uh, put on your video and please make your comments? <clears throat> Well, no, I think they did an excellent job. Uh, you know, the, the worried about doing the Bauman's angle, and that's a little hard to measure. There is a good test that you could do, and that's the semi-lunar test on the lateral. In other words, there should always be a, a clear sign, a clear point between the capitellum and the uh, semi-lunar notch. And if there's cubitus varus, it's over... over uh, you know, it actually is imposed on the proxima ulna, and you get kind of a moon shape in there. Uh, and then, I, you know, I think this other thing that you talked about, the late reduction, you know, the classic article that I quote came out of India. You folks had, and there was an article about 15 years ago, and if you did it late, then they had a very high instance of heterotopic bone. But other than that, I think you folks have just really done a super job of <clears throat> discussing this. And this is this diaphyseal metaphyseal fracture, I think is point because that is really difficult to do across pins. And that's what I've done. I do it retrograde. And I, I don't worry about doing a medial pin, but when I do, you always make a little tiny incision, identify the medial epicondyle and then you can do a medial pin. The only comments that I have, I think you've really covered it. I don't think I've got much else to say. You really covered it very, very well. Thank uh, you. One other, thing, one other thing, and Dr. Melman, is that if there's a high median nerve injury, that one you need to probably do right away. That's not one you do overnight. Because if they have um, high median nerve, they have an insensate um, compartment. So they can't tell you, they don't have the pain associated with it. I, I, I had one case that was referred in 
that that's what happened. The kid had a high median nerve, didn't have any nerves because he had an absence of the pain because his median nerve was out and he didn't have any sensation. So I, and I think Dr. Melman talks about that. And I think that's a good point. That if you have a high median nerve, you need to do a median reduction to make sure that patient comes back and watch them very closely. Yeah, we've kept some of those median nerve kids in the hospital for up to three days. Yeah. The, the Great. Other, so uh, we are. I think there's one other thing that we can learn. You know, we're giving you work countries that have great resources. And I think that some of the things we need to know, you guys ought to tell us, what do you do with a supraconner fracture if you don't have the C on? How do you treat that? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you talk <laughs> about the, uh, you, t you talk about the um, compartment syndrome. When late is it, was it, is it, effective to do a fasciotomy because I know um, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Rubricia uh, talks about if you wait late you don't need to do a fasciotomy because it doesn't do anything and the question is how late can you think that a fasciotomy is still beneficial because if it's been that way for two weeks fasciotomy is not going to do any good so you know I think there's if you had to do this again you need to give some of your people um, us because you you meet these problems. You know, uh, appearance, close reduction without C arms, and, um, and some of those things. But otherwise, I think you need to be congratulated on such a wonderful group of pictures. Thank you. Thank you. So, so uh, we've had an excellent two-hour session. Uh, we finished on time, 8.30, and uh, I would leave uh, this uh, stage to Taral to wind up and make the Thanksgiving as well as uh, last comments. Absolutely. So thank you, everybody, for a wonderful session. Uh, at the peak, we had more than 50 attendees joining this session. And we had one surprise delegate, which was uh, Dr. K. Wilkins. He attended. And uh, Dr. Wilkins, we want to tell you this, uh, this entire course emerged out of OSI POSNA fracture courses, which we used to do together. 2009, 2010, we went to Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and we wanted to continue. So it, it's all because of you that it's all happening. And uh, this is eight sessions happening. And we want all delegates to come back next Saturday, again, 6.15 join for a very interesting session on other elbow injuries, the lateral condyles, the uh, trash lesions, the mortgages. And we are not going to keep, uh, little, you know, we have a telegram group. So post your questions. We are there to answer. And then there is a beautiful IFIX treasury, which is uh, a list of videos, talks, the, re the review articles on uh, fractures in children prepared by our Indian uh, uh, faculty, so it's also available for you to 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 join. We we want to request Dr. Wilkins, sir, if we can have your videos to be added to this IFIX treasury. You no, know, it will be honor for us if you can lend your videos uh, of your lectures, which we have heard, but a lot of delegates present here have not heard. If you can add to the treasury, we'll write to you, and we want to have it all along. So, in this, fact, Dr. Uh, Skaggs yeah. is here, who is the editor of Ortho Bullets. He can make recommendations and suggestions how we can improve the treasury and Dr. Melman too. So, we would appreciate your inputs uh, and thank you very much for being here and uh, sharing your knowledge, expertise, and time. I'm sure we'll bother you more, even no, more I, in the I, future. I have one final comment. You gave me credit. No, all I did was give you an idea, and you folks are the ones that took the initiative to really work on this. So I, I think that the um, success is your initiative, not one of the things that has been really satisfying to me is see how the, the uh, POSI, the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India, has really become one of the premier orthopedic societies in the world. You guys have really done a super job. Thank you.
So thank you. Good night. And uh, uh, we hope thank to see you. you again soon next weekend. Thank you, David. Thank you, Charles. And uh, stay in touch. We'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sheetan, Sandy. good night. Thanks, Chital. Have a great Thanks, Sunday. Kay. Good morning. Goodbye, Sunday. Or, um, goodbye, Professor Wilkins. Thank you, sir. Bye. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you.